Romans chapter 11. We're surveying Paul's epistles, and I will admit that this passage in Romans 11 is one of the toughest passages to grasp and to understand and has been confused throughout Christianity. Uh, the Calvinists take uh, this passage in Romans 11 to prove uh, that God has eternally saved some, uh, uh, that God has, before time began, chose some for salvation, some people to salvation, and that God has chosen some to eternal damnation, which, which is, makes God out to be a monster. He, the Calvinists believe that God had preordained some for, to be saved, and he has also preordained, before they were ever born, some to be lost. God didn't do that. We know from Paul that God's will is that all men be saved and come unto knowledge of the truth. Peter says that God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God wants men saved. He created mankind for his, for his, for his own purpose. And he never wants a man to go to hell. But he is a gentleman, and he'll give you what you want. And if you reject him during your lifetime here, he'll say, okay then you've rejected me for this 80, 90 years. How about you just live like you want forever? And because God's wrath is eternal, because he's eternal, if you don't want to be with him in this little life, then he says, okay, then you can be separated from me for all eternity. That's the second death, separation from God for all eternity in the lake of fire. In Romans 11, that's not the issue. Romans 11, just a reminder, Romans chapter 9 Israel's past. Romans 10, Israel's future. The issue in Romans chapter 11 has to do with Israel's future. And when you look at these passages, because it's about to get real thick now, so I'm going to have to break it down. Na it's the issue in Romans 11 is the nation of Israel versus the nations, the Gentiles. God is making a distinction now about Israel and the Gentiles, the nations. The issue is not individuals in Romans 11. It's corporately. You got two group of people. You got a group called the nation of Israel, and you got a group called the Gentiles, the rest of the nations on, on the earth, okay? And we're going to look at what the first fruit, the root, and the branches. We left off in Romans chapter 11, down in verse uh, 9. Look at Romans 11, start at verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. We saw that last time. The <laughs> reason I brought up Calvinism is because they, they call the people who God has chosen for salvation the elect. The election here, we saw, has to do with the believing remnant of Israel. At the time Paul wrote Romans, at the time Saul was saved, maybe Apostle Paul, there was another program that had been operating. We're going to see that in the book of Acts. It's called the Kingdom Program. At the moment Saul was saved and, and God changed the program to the current dispensation of grace, all these Jewish believers who at that moment were trusting Christ as their Messiah, they got the kingdom. They were sealed. They were God's elect for this kingdom program. Okay, we saw all of that. Uh, the, uh, verse 7, what then Israel hath, up, that's the nation of Israel in a whole, as a whole, hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. What is Israel seeking for? The kingdom. God has been promising them this Davidic kingdom for a, for, a, for a long time, and they've been looking for it. They don't get it. Israel is set aside for a moment. Then he wrote, verse 7, but the election hath obtained it. Who are the elect election? Go up uh, in verse 5. Even so then, Romans 11, 5, at this present time, at the time that Paul wrote the book of Romans, which is there in, in, in Acts, also there is a remnant according to election of grace. God was gracious and allowed these people who were believing his program to them, the kingdom program at the time he changed the program and raised up Saul, all, Peter and I, that little flock of believers now are going to come back. They all died off years, thousands of years ago, a couple, almost a couple thousand years ago, but they will come back when Christ comes and sets up his kingdom on the earth. They're the Old Testament saints we talk about. They're going to come back at the second coming, and they're going to go in there. They got it. They got the kingdom. The rest of Israel, the unbelieving apostate Israel, the rejectors of Christ, they were blinded. They went, those people died and went to hell. Now, God is now reconciling both Jew and Gentile. If, if individual Jews, that's why it has nothing to do with ind individuals here, 
This has to do with the future, what God is going to do with the nation of Israel as a nation. But in the dispensation of grace, if you're an individual Jewish person or Gentile, you can be saved by the cross of Christ. Look what he says the, down in verse 7. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Okay? He says the rest. That's the rest of the nation of Israel, the unbelieving Israelites. Look at verse 8. According as it is written... Now, he's going to quote Isaiah 29. We saw that. God hath given them, that's the apostate Israel, the spirit of slumber. In Isaiah 29, it says deep sleep. The same thing he did with Adam. It says that God put Adam in a deep sleep. What happened? Well, God was doing something different. Adam had nothing to do with, with God's uh, uh, um, bringing Eve out of him. He just put him to sleep. Adam, he, he's done. And that's where Israel is today. God is not dealing with the nation of Israel today. They're in a deep sleep. They're just done. They're a spirit of slumber. Eyes that they should not see. When you're in that deep sleep, you can't see anything, not physically. And ears that they should not hear. And when you're in a real deep sleep, you can have all type of stuff going on around you. Sometimes you're in a lighter sleep, you can hear stuff. But when you're in a deep sleep, you can't even hear. You're dead to the world. Well, that's how Israel is. They can't see Christ. They can't hear Christ. They're in a deep sleep today, the nation. But it won't always be that way. Look what he says, verse 8. And ears that they should not hear until this day. And so he quotes Isaiah. Now watch him quote David in the Psalms. And David said, let their table be made a snare. What's the table? We saw the woman of Canaan, Matthew 15. She says, Lord, heal my, heal my, my daughter from this devil. She was a Gentile. He answered her not a word. He says, finally, he says, let the children first be filled. He got to fill Israel first. I'm, 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 I'm here to the lost sheep of Israel. She says, he says, it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Gentiles were dogs down back here. And she said, yea, Lord, but the dogs get the crumbs which fall from their master's table. The table is Christ. He's the place of provision and blessing for Israel. He had to fill Israel first, give them the blessing. He took up, they took up those 12 basketfuls after he multiplied the loaves and fishes. What was that? It was they got filled, and 12 is the number of, that's Israel's number, but it's the number of government. They're going to take the blessings of Christ and hand them out to the Gentiles. That's what that is all about in the kingdom. Well, right now, that's not the issue. Let their, verse 9, let their table be made a snare. The thing that was supposed to be their blessing is now going to snare them. That's Christ. The same Lord that was supposed to bless the nation of Israel, he's going to pour out his wrath on that nation right through here. See, the, the table, you ever, heard the, you ever heard the word, the tables are turned? That's where they got that from. See, these little things you hear in the world, they say, well, the tables are turned. That means it was doing, something was going this way, but now it turned on you. That's what, they got that from the Bible. They don't know it, they did, but that's what that's from. Let their table be made a snare and a trap. And a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. See, that's a quote from Psalm chapter 69. Go there with me. Go to Psalm 69. And what, what Psalm 69 is, is a messianic psalm about the crucifixion, the rejection of, of the Lord Jesus and the crucifixion uh, there in the nation of Israel. Psalm 69. Go there. In Psalm 69, we're just going to read verses 21 down to 28 so you can get the gist of it. Psalm 69, verse 21. This is how you know it's, it's about the Lord in the future <laughs> from there. He was on the cross. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. You remember in John 19, Christ was on the cross. One of the seven sayings of the cross was, I thirst. And it says that they handed him some vinegar. And what he was doing, he was fulfilling this prophecy. But also when he says, I thirst, what's going to hap what was happening is he's also suffering in his inner man. The, the, the man in Luke chapter 16 who was in hell, the rich man, when he was in hell, he says, Father Abraham, why don't you send Lazarus so that he can take the f his finger and dip it in water and put it on my tongue for I am tormented in his flame. He was thirsty. And what happens to your soul in hell? It's hot down there. You don't have no water. And guess what? You're going to thirst for all eternity. Well, when Christ says, I thirst, what that was significant of is him taking the second death there. And here, the, when he said that, they gave him vinegar to drink. And that's fulfilling Psalm 69, 21. 
Now look at verse 22. Because of Israel's rejection, watch what David says in verse 22. Let their table become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their what? Welfare, let it become a trap. Notice that Christ was sent by God the Father to the nation of Israel to be for their welfare. So, so they might be well, farewell. But because of their rejection of him on Calvary's cross, he ended up not being for their good, but for their evil. He be, he's going to be the one who pours out his wrath through the Antichrist. That's, that's coming from the Lord. It's called the day of the Lord. You know why it's called the day of the Lord? Because it's going to be the Lord having his day and, and recompense. That's what he's talking about over there in, in Romans 11, a recompense. He's going to pay back Israel for their evilness and the whole world. It's going to be a great day for righteousness. Verse 23. Psalm 69, 23, let their eyes be darkened. Notice, remember, he talks about that spirit of slumber, their eyes going to be darkened. And that, that they see not, but watch what else happens. And make their loins continually to shake. You know what that is? When, when, when this tribulation is poured out, you ever been anxious or nervous or maybe even scared? I had more scared. You know, I was attacked by a dog when I was a young man. He ripped, ripped me right there, got me. German Shepherd, she did. I was, I was at my cousin's house. My mother and, 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 her, and her, her cousin, you know, took all the children out somewhere. And they have a dog, and she just gave birth to babies, she, two German Shepherd puppies. The father stayed home, and he didn't realize I was in the house. So the dog was, when I'm there, when we're there, guests there, he has them chained up. Well, when everybody left, he just let the dog run freely with the puppies. I run in the house, I'm about eight or nine years old or 10 or whatever. I run in the house with my cousins once we got back from the mall or wherever we was at. I didn't know the dog was in the house. I saw the puppies though and I, I went and I was hugging the puppies, playing with them. The mother looked at me and was like, oh no you didn't, roof, and she jumped me and got me, right? Every time after that, that I saw a stray dog, and this is no joke, my loins shake. I continue. I would shake from that experience. To this day, I don't like stray dogs. I don't care. You know how people say any dog. I know y'all some dog. They go, he won't bite and all that. We know Eldon and, and Tyson don't. We don't. don't, don't <laughs> that's that's Steve and Missy's dogs. I love them. Eldon's the nicest little dog. He's so calm. <laughs> Tyson's hyper, but they don't bite. They don't bite me. They know me. But some strange dog, especially if it's like a German Shepherd, a big dog. I'm kind of edgy because of what happened 20 something years ago. Well, what's gonna happen out here is they're gonna be so nervous when they see all these things happen in the world. You're seeing glimpses of it, not that it's prophecy being fulfilled, but all the, all the worry about you know, gas prices and, and global warming and food prices, these types of things, the stage is being set for this time period. And what we're seeing just a glimpse of now is gonna be major, major, Majorly, uh, it's going to be worse in that day. And, no, and as the world sees all these bad things happen sent by the Lord, their, their loins are going to shake. It says there's going to be some tribulation on these people. Look at verse 24. David says to the Lord, pour out thine, what? Indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Over there in Romans, Paul says that, that people say, well, God, well, Paul never mentions hell. Now, Paul never mentions the word hell. The, the, you know why? Because he's the apostle of grace. The person who mentions hell more than anyone is the Lord Jesus. You go and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He talks more about hell than he does heaven or anything else because he, he, he put them under the law. The reason Paul never mentions the word hell is because he's speaking to believers primarily. We're not going to hell. We're in Christ. But he does mention the concept of hell in Romans. He says, indignation and wrath upon every soul that doeth evil to the Jew first and all to the Gentile. That's this. Verse 24, pour out thine indignation. Indignation is what you feel on the inside. You're indignant. His, 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 his righteous holiness has been offended. And what he's going to do is he's going to pour out his wrath. Watch this. And let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Now, who David is speaking about is the nation of Israel. He's not even talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about the Israel, the apostate Israel. Okay? Look at the rest of that verse. Look at verse 25. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. 
Israel would dwell in these booths called tabernacle, little tents. That, that right there is quoted about Judas. The, the apostle Judas was a type of unbelieving Israel, apostate Israel. Did you know? Why was Judas in your Bible? Why was he the betrayer? Why did he betray Christ with a kiss? And the Lord says, my friend, why betrayest thou me with a kiss? See, Israel was the friends of God, the friend of God. Abraham was called the friend of God, James said. And what Judas is a type of is the, is the, the, the man who is his, his brother. Judas was a Jewish man. Yet he did not believe on the Lord, although he was with him. And he ended up being his enemy by betraying him. That's Judas is a type of apostate Israel. And what happened to Judas? He went to hell. Is what's going to happen to all the Jews who don't believe on him. That's what this is about. Let their habitation be desolate. Their habitation, Israel, the nation. And let, their, and, and let none dwell in their tents. Look at verse 26. Why? For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. Ah. David is writing this about himself, but he's really talking about the Messiah. Watch this. When David committed adultery and murder. God sent prophet Nathan to him and says, you know what, David, you're not going to die. I'm going to have mercy on you, but your child is going to die. Your son is going to die in your place. The innocent child. Remember Bathsheba had a boy before Solomon. That baby died and he died for the sins of David, type of the Lord Jesus. David didn't die. That's a picture. Somebody says, well, why didn't David die under the law? He committed adultery. He committed murder. There's no, there's no sacrifice under those Ten Commandments. You commit murder and adultery, you die. Well, because first of all, God knew David's heart. David wasn't rebelling against God. David was just weak in his flesh. He, had, he was a man after God's own heart. He was God's anointed. But more importantly, can I tell you, God is zealous about his types. And by sparing David's life and taking the life of the innocent son of David, it was a picture of the son of David, the innocent son of David, the Lord Jesus, okay? That's what's going on. And notice how David puts this. Verse 26, for they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. Part of David's judgment was not just the child would die, but David, his, his family life never was the same. See, sin does have consequences. David didn't go to hell. He didn't get stoned and go to hell. But guess what? The rest of his life was a mess. His own sons walked in his footsteps. Solomon could not control his lust. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 con He had 1,000 women. Lip That's just what was living in his palaces. A concubine in Israel was a virgin in Israel who the king would be with the king. She might only be with him once, but she could never be with another man. She, she became a perpetual uh, almost like a widow. She, he just put her up. He took care of her and stuff. But once you were part of the king's harem, as it were, you couldn't go. You wasn't let free. And, and that's what happened. Well, he couldn't control his lust. His son Absalom. You, you read about David's sons, and they were all crazy because of David's sin. Because they looked at dad and said, dad, if you do it, we can do it. And it was a mess. And the man who was smitten was David. David was smitten of God. But somebody else was smitten of God. If you read Isaiah 53, it says that when Christ, a, a prophecy about Christ and what was happening on the cross, he was smitten of God and afflicted. So the one they were persecuting was the one who was smitten of God, the Lord Jesus. Israel, verse 26, persecutes him. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. So not only will it be the Lord Jesus, but in this day it's going to be the little flock. When we get to this part of Romans, as we're coming up on it, you're going to see that in the Bible, what's true about the Lord is true about his people. We're called the church, the body of Christ. We're part of his body. Paul says, as the body is one, your physical body is one, but has many members, and each of those members have different functions, so also is Christ. When God looks at us, he sees us in Christ. Christ is the head, we're his body. How, how Jesus Christ operates in the earth today is through you and I as grace believers. We're his body. But even back here, the nation of Israel and in the future, the little flock, remember he says, comes back, he's going to reward them. He's going to say, because when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. 
When I was hungry, you gave me meat. And they're going to say, well, Lord, when did we see you? You've been in heaven. He says, when you do it to the least of these, my brethren. You remember that? You do it unto me. Well, that's what's happening here. The same grief that Christ was put under, the little flock was. You're seeing that in the book of Acts. As we look at the book of Acts, Peter and them are being persecuted the same way the Lord was. I'm going to show you something today. Something happened with Peter and them by the, by the religious leaders of Israel. When you go and look at the Lord Jesus Christ's life, the same thing happened. So what happened to him is happening to them. By the way, the same rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ that Paul received, you and I as grace believers received. Don't think it's strange that your brethren and sisters in Christ, the religious Christians, reject you because you believe you make too much of Paul and all that. Can I tell you, Paul wrote letters to the Corinthians who were believers. They didn't like Paul. They said, you make too much of Paul. And they, they got saved through Paul's gospel. The Galatians were believers who got saved through Paul's gospel, and yet they didn't like Paul either. He had to tell them, I'm your apostle. Remember, you and I today, when we tell other Christians about Paul, they think we're nuts, don't they? They say, what do you, that's a cult. No. We just, we just experienced the same persecution that Paul did and the same persecution the Lord did. Look at verse 27. Psalm 69, 27. Add iniquity unto their iniquity. Just pile it up on them. And let them not come into thy righteousness. Don't, they, they're not going to go in the kingdom, these unbelieving Jews. Last verse, verse 28. I love this one. Now watch, now watch this. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and be not written with the righteous. What, what, what David is talking about is something called the book of life. You've probably heard of it. Paul mentions it in Philippians chapter 3, I believe, maybe 4, Philipp, book of Philippians. He says, whose names are written in the book of life. The book of life is, some, is, is God's diary. Let me show you some book of life. God wrote a book called the book of life before he created anything. God being God, he looked down the corridors of time and wrote everybody's name who would believe his word in every dispensation. Don Anderson, Steve Reed. He just wrote it down, wrote it down. He wrote this book, okay? Now, he knows the end from the beginning. He didn't, he didn't like the Calvinists say, make it happen. He just could see it happen. In Israel's program, every Jew, see, this is what a Calvinist, if, if they thought about it, this is what happens. Every Jew from Abraham on, every seed of Abe, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I have to say that because Ishmael was the seed of Abe. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Every child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what we know as the Jews, their names are written in the book of life. from birth. You, they could be blotted out. Let's say their name was there. Let's say uh, Eli, Eli, Elijah, Elijah. Not our Elijah, but not the Elijah from the Bible. Let's say a young man named Elijah. But you see throughout history of Israel, they would reject God's word. What he would do is he would take an eraser like this and say, well, you were part of the covenant. He says that soul will be cut off and God just go blot him out. That's what David's talking about. If you were a Jew, you were automatically, that's why when you talk to Jewish people today, they think it's okay. They're okay with God no matter what because they're a Jew. You ever talk, I don't know if you get to talk to them. Some of us do. If you know any Jewish people, they think they're all right just because they were born a Jew. Well, if that's, that's where they get that from because in, in, in the law of Moses, they already have a book and every Jewish person is written in there and you could be blotted out. God will just blot you out. That's what he's saying there. Look at that. Verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and be not written with the righteous. And in Israel's program, the fact that you were born a Jew was good enough. You had to write bloodlines. You had to do something against the word of God to get blotted out. It's not the way today. Today, even though God knows who's going to believe, Paul wants you to be written in the book of life. See, Gentiles have to be written in there, okay, or at least checked on, you know, God God knows who's going to believe, but it's a little different. As a Gentile, you weren't automatically in the book of life. Some moment you believe the gospel of grace, 
and you were written in there as it were, okay? But I just want you to know that when it comes to Israel, just being a Jew was good enough. They were, their name is written in the book of life, and they could be blotted out. God did a lot of blotting out right around here. When Christ came, he did a lot of blotting out of Jews because they wouldn't believe his son. Go back to the book of Romans. So I want you to see that's what's going on there, Romans chapter 11. Now you need to understand that because we're about to get into some hard passages about being cut off, being grafted in. What is all this talking about? Well, God had a program with the nation of Israel where they were special to him. Let's look at it. Look at verse 11. Verse 10. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. I say then, who says this, Paul? Have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? Now, think with me for a moment. When did the nation of Israel stumble? They stumbled at the cross. When, when, when God put this sure foundation, we're going to see this. I want to show you these verses. When he put Christ in the nation of Israel, some believed on him, and they were exalted. They, they stood upon him. He was the sure foundation. Others, because they wouldn't believe on him, they stumbled. Now, in the law, God says, oh, we got to see it. There's a peculiar little verse in the law. It says, when you see a blind man in the way, do not put a stumbling block in his way and make him fall. God knows the sin nature. And he says, if you see that man blind, don't put anything in his way to make him fall. Yeah, we, we, gotta, we might have to see that. They stumbled at the cross. And what did the Lord say? One of the seven saints, Father, what? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. So God didn't pour out his wrath because of that right then. He gave them a one-year extension, and then he's going to do something. Let's look at that. They stumbled at the cross. But God didn't want them to fall. He wanted them to believe. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 31. Romans 9, 31. <coughs> but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained, attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Wherefore? Because they sought it not by what? Faith but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. You see that? When Christ came, he told Israel, you can't keep the law perfectly, Israel. The religious leader says, oh, yes, we can. Christ says, you're evil in your heart. Moses says, don't kill. Now, you haven't killed, but I say, if you ever look, if you ever hate a brother, hate a man, and those religious leaders hate you because you weren't as good as them. Christ said, you committed murder in your heart. Moses said, don't commit adultery. Now, they never, well, some of them did, but most of them never committed adultery. But they did look on a woman lustfully, and they committed adultery where? In their heart. See, what Christ did, he made that law even more. He magnified that law and said, you can't keep it. So you need me. You need me, Israel. I'm here. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Redeemer. You need me. Go to Isaiah chapter, uh, before you go. Look at verse 32. Because they sought it not by faith, they didn't mix faith with their works, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay where? In Zion. That's Israel. That's Jerusalem. A what? Stumbling stone and rock of offense. You know why God sent his son to Israel? Now watch this. He does this to us too. God sends his word to test your heart and see how easily you offend it. The biggest obstacle to people sticking with the grace message, you see people come and go. And, and I've been asked over the years of ministry, well, why did it happen? Why somebody come and they stay for a few weeks and then they go? I say because they got offended at the doctrine. Because they've been taught it all along this way. The, the word rightly divided comes and God gives them truth the way he wants to give it to them and their heart can't take it. Dwayne mentioned on Thursday night, perfect example, we were doing a conference about the heavenly places and we showed how we're created for the heavenly places, the body and we, the, the wisdom of God and the mystery. And he says one of his family members came there 
She got it. And she, she sat there and said, I don't care what Dwayne or the verses say. I'm going to live on earth. I'm going to live on earth. That was her words. Well, if she's saved today, she's just foolish. She's not. If she trusted Christ at the rapture, she's going out or when she dies, she's going to be up there and she's not coming. Down. She's not. Earth is for who? The nation of Israel, right? But because her heart did not like the fact that she wasn't going to be a part of Israel's earthly blessings, she didn't esteem and value what God had created her for in the members of, as a member of the body of Christ, she's going to say, I don't care what's it. I'm going to live down here. She's foolish. You can't, she's not big enough to make God. God's going to say, okay, since you want to, here you go. Here you go. No. Well, God's word offends people. It offends your heart. It offends your flesh. And you need to endure through that and not fall because you're, you, you've been offended by the word. Look what he says here, a rock of, verse 33, of what? Offense. But here, here's the issue. And whosoever believeth on what? Him shall not be ashamed. Christ was that rock of offense and stumbling stone. Now we're going to look at, as we conclude, we're going to look at a couple of passages in the Old Testament there in Isaiah because I want to see this issue of what's, what, what was going on in Israel as we look at this stuff. Get two passages. Go to Isaiah chapter 28. In Isaiah 8. Isaiah 28 and Isaiah 8. You know who the Bible says is a great, is, is, is a great example of faith? Abraham. Let me tell you how God tests Abraham's heart. He's going to test each of our hearts with something. With some truth that your flesh is going to say, no. And, and watch this. I'm not a father yet, but I can imagine. You all who are parents. Abraham has this boy named Isaac. Isaac was about 30-something years old when, when that whole thing in Genesis 22. He wasn't a young boy. He was a type of the Lord Jesus. He was an older man, basically. But in that culture, he lived with his daddy until he got married. Abraham has been loving on this boy. By the way, he already had Ishmael, whom he loved, whom God sent out. His heart is already bare from the fact that his firstborn, Ishmael, is gone with his mother, Hagar, and off to Egypt there. So he really holding on to his second boy, Isaac, the promise. He's been living with him 33 years, loving him, and just like him. He's like his daddy, just loving him. And all of a sudden, God's word comes and says, Abraham, yes, yes, Lord. I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, and go offer him on this mountain over here. And you know what Abraham says? He didn't say, well, Lord, what? he went, okay, come on. That's faith. Now, I don't know about you. I don't have a son, but if you have a son, a daughter, a child, and, and, and God says, now, your child has to die for me, we'd probably be arguing, wouldn't we? That, that rub our heart. Let me show you faith. Being not weak in faith, Abraham says, son, let's go. God says to do it. His love for Isaac paled in comparison to, for his love for the Lord, and he took his son to the point. The son says, Father, what, what are we doing? Son, I got it. Father, I see the, uh, the wood for the burnt offering. We got the flame. We see the knife. I'm looking around. I don't, where's, the, where's the lamb at? Where's the lamb? Where, where's the sacrifice? What did Abraham tell him? God will provide himself a lamb. Beautiful. But as Abraham lays his son down on that wood and he cuffs his hands in there just like this, Isaac is like, what are you doing? But you know what Isaac did? He trusts his daddy. Daddy, whatever you want. That's faith, ain't it? He knew what was happening. They've been doing it to lambs. He says, my daddy is about to sacrifice me because the word of God says. And as Abraham comes down to slit the throat, that's what they did. As he comes down with the knife. The angel of the Lord stops us and says, I see, I see what you're doing, Abraham. You love me more than anything in life. That's going to happen to all of us. Just be ready when it comes. Chapter 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion. What's those next three words? For a what? Foundation. Notice that God didn't send Christ just to offend them. He, 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 sent Israel, he sent him to Israel to be their foundation. A foundation is something where you stand where you won't be shaky. You stand upon a foundation. He says, that's why I sent him, okay? 
for a foundation. Look at the rest of that. A stone, a tried stone. He proved himself worthy because he, 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 he believed God's word perfectly. A precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, Paul didn't quote it that way. That's a tribulation passage. Don't be hasty to take the mark of the beast, Israel. Okay, this is it's a prophetic pro, uh, program. But I want you to see that God didn't send Christ just to offend them, to test their heart. He actually sent them for him to, them to believe on him and have a foundation. Go to Isaiah 8. We'll look at Isaiah 8 and Leviticus and conclude. Isaiah chapter 8, look at verse 14. Speaking of the Lord, the Messiah, and he shall be for a what? Sanctuary. A sanctuary is a safe haven. But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. There's Israel and Judah. And for a gin. A gin has, is not the liquor. A gin is a, is a thing that trapped it trapped birds or trapped animals, okay? It was like a trap. A gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall what? Stumble and do what? Fall. And be broken and be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. And what you see is, as, as, as Christ is presented to Israel, some believe, called the disciples, they, they, they got the testimony, the little flock. Many, most of Israel rejected him. And instead of being that sure foundation and that, and that rock, he became a rock of offense. And they tripped over him. They stumbled and they fell. One more passage before we go back to Romans 11. Leviticus 19. I used to wonder about this passage, why God wrote this. It's, it's a weird little thing about the blind in Israel. Leviticus 19, look at verse 14. Thou shalt not curse the deaf. Somebody can't hear, don't be mocking them, cursing them because they can't hear you, because God can hear you nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God, I am the Lord. What God is telling Israel, by using physical examples, he's talking to them spiritually. God desires Israel to believe. He's telling them, just because you've hardened your, your heart and you won't hear my word, I'm trying to tell you that. When, when, when I do that thing on tongues, there's some wonderful things about the, the tongues back here and the tongues in, in, in our dispensation before they were complete. God was doing something with those tongues. Israel wouldn't hear them, but he was talking to them, plain and clear, and then he added tongues to it for a reason. You have to listen to the message. But when they blinded, look what he says. Don't put a stumbling block. God did not intend Christ to be a stumbling block to Israel. He's not this evil God that the Calvinists make him out to that wants people to be lost for eternity. No, no, no. He gave them to be a blessing. He gave him to be a blessing. God says, don't put a stumbling block before the blind. And Israel's blind. God didn't put, it, put him there so that they might stumble. What God put him to be is like a staff in their hand so that they can see where they're going. In fact, he was going to open up their eyes. That's what he was doing. He was opening up blind eyes. End in Romans. Go to Romans 11 as we conclude. Verse 11, I say then, this is Paul saying it, have they stumbled that they should fall? What's, that, what's those next two words? July 1st, uh, the first Sunday in July, we're going to do a study on God forbid. We're going to look at every time Paul says that, and it's a wonderful study. Be here with us at 8.30 service on the first Sunday in July. God forbid. Paul says, may it never be. As God's spokesman, God did not intend Israel to fall, but rather through their what? fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles 
for to provoke them to jealousy. Notice that he didn't put Christ there to make them fall. He says, Father, forgive them. But next week we're going to see that they did fall. And where that fall took place that Christians don't recognize is in Acts 7 when they stoned Stephen. Israel committed the unpardonable sin. Christians say, what is the unpardonable sin and can I commit it? it no, you can't commit it in this dispensation. There's not a sin that God won't forgive you of in Christ. And if you're a lost person and you trust the shed blood of Christ, he'll forgive you all your sins, even blaspheming the Holy Ghost, but not Israel. And when Stephen was filled with the Holy Ghost and they stoned Stephen in Acts 7, that was the unpardonable sin. That's when they fell. And by, when they fell, God sent his salvation unto the Gentiles through Paul to provoke Israel to jealousy. Verse 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world. They fell in Acts 7, right? Now watch what else happened in the book of Acts. And the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles. When did they diminish? When we go through Acts chapter 9 through 28, you see the diminishing of the nation of Israel. That's what you see in the book of Acts. We'll see it. From Paul's salvation to Acts 28, you see God's program with Israel diminish. Right down. How much more are there what? Fullness. Now, here's where we're going to end, and we're going to pick up verse 13 about Paul's epistles. When Israel comes to their collective census, when that nation believes as a whole, as it were, on the Messiah, when they believe it's going to happen after us, God's going to open their eyes so they can see. He judged them in blindness, what he did. But when he takes that judgment of blindness off, and they see, and they're going to go through this punishment, what's going to happen is the whole entire world will be blessed, not just spiritually, but physically. In this kingdom that the nation of Israel is going to rule with Christ, the whole world will go back to paradise like it was when Adam was created. Somebody asked me, how long will people live in the kingdom? Well, I said during the first thousand, you know, somebody says, will people die in the kingdom? I said, yes, during the first thousand years, people can die. But at the ages that they're going to die is going to be great. Just like in Genesis 5, people died at 800 years, 900 years. You could go, you could be born in the kingdom, go 800 years and not break the Ten Commandments, and on your 805th birthday, decide to commit adultery, your body will be able to do it. You won't be old like we know old when you're 80 and 90. Their bodies will be just like they were back here because God is going to reverse the curse. And that 800-something-year-old dude can commit adultery, and he will be stoned to death and go to hell. So you, you can live for a long time in that 1,000 years. Now, after the 1,000 years, he's going to deal with all the unrighteous. There's going to be no more death and all that after the 1,000 years. only going to be righteous. Nobody's going to die, okay? Now, we're going to conclude here. Sorry I didn't get to this stuff. Just, just keep that in your mind for next week. But I wanted you to see this. Issue in Romans 11 is Israel's future. He's dealing with the nation of Israel and the nations. Not individuals like the Calvinists said, but corporately, body, uh, you know, corporate. Next week, we're going to look at the first fruit, the root, and the branches, okay? That'll give you something to think about. Please read Romans 11, um, verses 13 through 36. That's the second half of it, and be ready, okay? All right, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. Father, I, I realize and the saints know that uh, the passage in Romans 11 is a very difficult one, and we do have to take our time going through it. We, we await the time in Romans 12 and the rest of your uh, book of Romans where the doctrine just flies right off the page, and, and it has particular details about life in Christ. But, Father, we need to know the place and purpose of the nation of Israel in your plan. Most of Christians think Israel is finished or that we are spiritual Israel. We're not. You have a program with them coming up. We need to know that. As we go through these tough passages in, in the second half of Romans 11, we just ask that your spirit gives us truth and insight so that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened. We thank you for the privilege of uh, studying your word so, so intently, Father. As we take our break to the study of the book of Acts in the second session, we give you thanks and praise. In Christ's name, amen.